Welcome to Good Bowling, presented by the English Bowling Association, a training tool aimed at helping and assisting aspiring bowlers. Throughout the DVD we shall be looking at key areas of the sport with the help and advice and expertise of some of England's world-class performers. My name is Tony Alcock and I shall be joined by some very good friends of mine who will be sharing their trade secrets with you in this DVD. We've come to an idyllic part of the British Isles to film this DVD, to the Cotswolds region in the county of Gloucestershire and to the village of Painswick, where the historic Falcon Bowling Club is playing host to the film crew and bowlers involved in the making of this skills DVD. Five world-class English bowlers will be on hand throughout this DVD to give you their side of the story and to pass on one or two hints and tips that will hopefully be of interest to you as aspiring bowlers and may ultimately provide that motivation for you to push on to the next level. Amy Monkhouse is a full senior international both outdoors and in. Amy has had considerable success on the world stage in recent years, with ladies fours gold at the World Championships, under 25 singles gold and pairs bronze at the 2002 Commonwealths. The next bowler is world number one for the 2005-2006 season. Andy Thompson has been on the international stage at senior level both outdoors and in since 1979. He was the World Indoor Singles Champion in 94 and 95 and he has 13 EIBA titles to his name. Ellen Faulkner has had an amazing three seasons, culminating in that fantastic win at the 2005 Potters World Ladies Match Play. She also has World Team and Fours Gold and Commonwealth Fours Gold at international level. Our next bowler almost needs no introduction. He's appearing on this DVD for very obvious reasons. After 65 years of bowling, there's almost nothing that David Bryant doesn't know about the sport. You'll have the opportunity to listen to the views of a man who has 12 world, five Commonwealth and 26 national titles to his name. And finally, it's the bowler who for much of his career was considered to be David's partner in crime. Tony Alcock can list 15 world titles to his name, but is also the driving force behind this project as the England Bowling Association's Chief Executive Officer. Let's get back to Tony. The idea with this tool is to be able to dip in and out of the skill areas in whichever order you wish. Each section is a skill session in itself. With our players demonstrating the techniques, discussing when to use them in your game, and also providing some ideas on how to practice these techniques at your own club. There are some core areas such as grip of the bowl, use of the bowl and delivery, which then progress to more advanced techniques on aiming and weight shots. In the last area, we will include a look at firing. From these areas of bowling, the DVD develops further to allow our players to give you some of their top tips on singles play and tactics. This is where things really get interesting, as myself, David, Andy, Ellen and Amy have all agreed to pass on some of their trade secrets about our sport. And finally, for those of you who are keen to promote your sport and your club, the English Bowling Association has also added a five-minute marketing feature suitable to play to schools as part of your own marketing presentation. So that's what we have to offer you on this DVD. I hope you have as much fun learning from us as we've had while making this advanced skill tool. Remember, don't try to take too much on board in one go. Be patient while developing your techniques, but most of all enjoy the DVD. Good luck and good bowling. Shot! <laughs> 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 That's the usual! <laughs> <laughs>
Oh no! I bumped that one into the ground. Ah, oh, da. Classic delivery. One eh? more go, then it's David. <laughs> <laughs> he can't do it. Yeah, it's quite amazing, you know, that um, a lot of uh, world-class um, performers have problems with the grip at some times during their career. It's not just something that actually um, affects people just starting the, the game. If we actually look at all our grips, we're all different. I mean, for example, you know, the manufacturers will tell us that basically these, these grips along here are for the, are for the first thing, finger, the little finger and the thumb. And none of us do it. I mean, if I actually look at my grip, it doesn't conform with any of that, in as much that the only finger that I've really got on, on the grip line is, is, is that one there. So, so I actually had that grip, and I, I grip my bowl all the time like that. I mean, Andy, do you, do you change your grip and for a certain circumstances? Not normally, Tony. I mean, I think I have occasionally, sometimes on the drive, I've actually maybe used the grip, but uh, I'm exactly like you. I actually tend to have my thumb slightly high up on the bowl which I would say is probably more of a, a southern hemisphere type grip. I think a lot of the players down in Australia and New Zealand, uh, it's more of a touch type grip. So my thumb is actually quite high up on the ball and the fingers below, below are not running parallel with the ball but are actually running across it. And as you talk about this little finger, this little finger here is actually riding up slightly up the side of the ball, not yeah. on the grip. So I actually don't touch the grip at all. However, I've always played with a grip ball. But it's just, you? Uh, you know, yeah. that's the way that I, I grit the ball for, for all greens. Really. But don't you find that a disadvantage in, in the wet weather? Because you, you, if you look at the, there's a distance between the thumb and your bowl because you, you've pushed your bowl up yeah. into the hand. So there's a, there's a distance. So you haven't got the full contact. You don't find that difficult enough, have you? And in the wet conditions, yes, I do. And that you is do. probably the only time where I actually feel as though I have to change the grip. In other words, the thumb goes onto the side of the ball, more onto the grip and the fingers probably are more cupping the ball as opposed to sort of this one where it's sort of more of a just yeah. feeling the tips of the the tips of the fingers onto the edge of the ball. Yeah. I do change for the, sometimes I used to change for the drive, however as you say only for wet conditions where yeah. I feel that yeah. grip, the ball when it goes back would be slipping out the fingers. Yeah. So that, that, that's where I change. Yeah, you're more textbook though aren't you? Yes, I'm yeah. uh, very much using the grips. As you can see the thumb is uh, on the grip on the right hand side going round so it's much more textbook. Yeah, that's why you're so clever. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously it is the first finger, the little finger and the thumb. That's what that's what they say those grips are devised yeah. for really. I mean, do you use the grips? You find that Yeah, useful? I've always I've never bowled with uh, a non-grip bowl. I've always had a grip, which is I suppose where I naturally when I picked it up, yeah. that's where I naturally went to. Cuz you you don't you don't like anything on on your you know you you had these stuff to have a smooth bowl David. You don't you didn't have any grips on your bowl at all and you hated anything on your bowl like a piece of dirt or a piece of grass. You used to hate that, didn't you? Absolutely. And what about um, the grip though? Would you stay use the same sort of Um grip? well I I I'm a bit like Andy in that respect. I tried to keep the fingers running parallel to the running base, but but um I let the fingers go where it's comfortable. I believe on a fast green there's less things to go wrong. But where you, when you're taking your arm back and you have to put so much body weight behind the ball, um, things do go wrong. So therefore, on our heavy greens in the, in the British Isles, the bigger the better. Um, and it goes up the green more easily, I believe, because it goes over the... I wouldn't use a heavyweight bowl on British greens mm. in, in the um, mm. Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, yes, I would use a heavyweight every mm. time. You don't mm. always hold the ball like that, though, David. You used to hold, actually hold the ball on the side, didn't you? I mean, yes, I, I did. But I did with a smaller, smaller ball. Yes, yeah. I did. A ball but like isn't that. that isn't that a disadvantage if you're on the side? Because I mean, surely that ball is going to come out your hand in a peculiar way. Then I think actually, if 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 you hold the ball up and and and, and you you let you take the weight of the ball there, your arm is perfectly straight. As soon as, soon as you bring your thumb in, your elbow comes across. So you 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 you, you could hook. But if you're playing the backhand, you'd hold the bowl up. And that, t that tends to happen when I'm driving, if I'm holding it like that. I can hold it, I used to hold it up on the backhand. 
I didn't hold it up deliberately, it just happened. But you used to, however, hold them on the side, David. Yeah, I thought more, 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 yeah, more, yeah. more, on, more on the side, but you, you can't with this one. If I, if I no, but I'm talking one. about years yeah. ago when you first yeah. started. Didn't you actually have your, the, the side of your hand on the side of the bow? More like that. Yeah. More, more like that. that. More like that. Yeah, more like that. Right. Now, but anybody watching that would, would say, well, that, you know, that, you're not supposed to do that. The textbooks tell yeah. us that you're yeah. supposed to have all the hand behind. But, I mean, why would you argue that? Um... I, I, well, I, I think as long as your fingers are, are, are more or less parallel and you're not wobbling it, and not, in other words, if it's not broken, don't try and mend it. Um, I think that's it. I mean, you, you get some of the best people in sport have been completely unorthodox. But, but, well, why do you do that? I don't know. I've always done it. Right. And all right, if, if, if he's the best player in his sport for miles around, then he doesn't want to alter it, does he? But I think... There is a difference in technique when you go and play on the fast greens in the southern hemisphere. Mm. I think it's horses for courses. I love the fast greens. I don't like the British greens <laughs> outdoors. They're the heavy ones. They're hard to but get you, by on. But and, and, and with, with regard to yourself, Amy, what, um, what, what sort of grip have I you, have basically you got? basically pick the bowl up how I want to pick it up and how it feels. And I've never thought about how it's, you know, how it's in my hand. Although it was pointed out to me, I think by yourself, Tony, that I hold it slightly on the side and it's not quite square in my hand if it was square in my hand it would be more like that yeah um the bowl is actually slight to the side so i'm feeling more for the grip yeah definitely but my little fingers across the bowl um there it looks really wonky but it's comfy for me so. yeah yeah i mean obviously w what we have to remember and i think we, we can we can all self-adjust and we're all experienced players but i think i think basically in the southern hemisphere when they're really really keen on, on keeping a uniform coaching, they will actually, and most of the Australian players do, tend to put the bowl in the hand and, and ex exactly in the, in, the square, in the square so that they've got that absolutely, before they do anything else. And then you'll see them push the bowl with the other finger and put the thumb on. Hence, that, you know, that grip that's a bit like yours, the textbook that, you know, when they're taught to do that as uniform. Now, I actually argue the fact that in Australia, most of the conditions are the same every time they play outside. But we play on heavy greens, wet greens, fast greens, slow greens. So we have to devise um, a grip that is actually useful. But interestingly enough, a lot of top players have had some problem with the grip at, at some point of time. I remember uh, David Gourlay, for example, look, having, I was looking at one time, he had a particular problem with a forehand. And he came to me privately and asked me if I could help him. And it actually wasn't his forehand, it was the actual, the actual grip. And we realigned that. So he almost then did something different on the forehand than the backhand. He got himself into, into the situation. And a lot of people, in, in trying to get the bowl into the hand comfortably, let this little finger raise right up. So, of course, when the bowl releases, it's going on to three fingers, yeah. and that's when it becomes unbalanced. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big problem, yeah. is that they lose a little finger. By the little finger being on there, it's gone off the bowl. Immediately, the bowl has left the hand. Yeah. So it's those three fingers, and that's why the, the bowl goes to the, to the right or to the left, because what happens, you feel it going, and all of a sudden, you wring your hand across, yeah. and exactly. the bowl goes. And, and it's basically, you know, a lot of people don't understand that the fact that the, the, the way that they're bowled narrow is actually not because their arm has come across or they've aimed it wrong, it's come out the hand at the wrong time. We have played with one of the great players, John Bell. Now John Bell, if you actually look at John Bell's delivery, his little finger here comes up the side of the bowl. Now John actually, it always stays up the side of the bowl. The bowl does have a slight wobble, but he manages to, to control it. So therefore, yeah. you know, if some people actually think that is wrong, I wouldn't necessarily say it is wrong. You know, for, for somebody as good a player as John Bell was, he he managed to control the ball with a finger right up the side of the ball, but yeah. he managed to control that slight wobble away. So I don't think it's necessarily wrong no. to say it's actually, no. you know, you should... I think it's a fault, I think if you're aware of it. I think it's like just a, a troubleshooting uh, experience really, as an exercise of this is happening, it's, it's one thing that people can look at is, mm. is their actual grip and, and if that little finger is, you know, moving that little finger around, if that does alter it, I think as a troubleshooting mm -hmm. exercise is, is a good thing to, mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. Do you use any, any grip, any wax? Uh, I don't myself. I've got, for outdoors, I use a, a, a wet cloth. When it's dry, I use a wet cloth because yeah. I feel sometimes it's a bit of a comfort to me because I'm so used to it. But other times I feel just a little um, a bit of dampness because my fingers can go really shiny mm -hmm. and it just gives that little uh, slight bit of grip extra 
that I need. So you don't like wax at all. It feels no, feels I awful don't. To you. Yeah. I just haven't yeah. used it. Yeah. I think. Well, you used to plaster your bowls with wax. Yes. Now, I, I, you see, if you've got a dry hand, your hand <laughs> goes glassy. <laughs> your hand goes glassy, and therefore you, you know you don't want you, you you want something on it, and a damp cloth does it. But if if your hand perspires then the bowl gets slippery. Yes. So that's when wax comes in. Yours is unbelievable. unbelievable. I've picked up your bowls, Davis, but they're unbelievable. I mean, it's <laughs> no. like glue. I, I used to shake Absolute. hands with him when he did a good shot. I used to get stuck to him. Like I, couldn't get, I couldn't get away. <laughs> I, always put, I always put some of my bowls before every single game I play. I always put a sort of uh, grip wax uh, product on my bowls. Every single game I play, indoors, outdoors, always do. They're good shiny and they're good tackiness, and I feel as though I need that yeah. in all games. I, just that little, I think David is above me even. I mean, yeah. David's is really really tacky well, and i no, i i only use a light wax um in so normal conditions <laughs> but when it's wet i don't want it to come off yeah. so so i use a heavier one yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. the bowls are even bigger yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what about you ellen i tend to only use it after it's rained because when it rains and dries out the bowl then to me feels slippy and shiny mm. in your hand so then i would would apply it um or get a damp cloth so you can get that that extra texture to it. Otherwise, it tends to, you know, shine against your hand and actually come out of your hand. So, are we saying fundamentally then that providing we know what we're doing um, and we do it the same every time, it, it's reasonably okay? And, and we've actually discovered, you know, that that we don't actually change the grip very much for very different circumstances. We have a fundamental grip and we yeah. and we stick to it. And yeah. you know, so and what's actually interesting to me is that three of you. Um, have have the thumb relatively high on the bowl, and I actually think in this country that's that's an exception rather than the rule. I see a lot of people outdoors, and I find that their thumbs are a lot lower, because the lot the lower the thumb is on the bowl, the more the bowl is in the hand. Yeah. And a lot of people. I think it's like Crown Green bowlers, Tony. If you, if you ever watch the Crown Green game, there are very, very few would actually have their thumb on the top. They actually hold the ball like that. So yeah. therefore, it's easier, I think, to get more power into the delivery with your thumb on the side. Yeah. I think with your thumb on the top, it's more of a touch delivery. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, to me, it's better, I think, with the, the thumb higher for faster greens. Yeah. And I think for slower greens, I think it's always better. As you say, on the UK conditions, I think it's better with the thumb on the side. Personally, yeah. if I was recommending yeah. that. Yeah. Good, good, good tip. Yeah, thanks very much. Many people um, say that the important aspect of the, of the game is actually length. But in my experience, it's all about line because when people actually get the line or bowlers get the line, length usually is easier to find. David, you have been a person who has been very disciplined in achieving the line and assessing a rink. Tell me what you use as, as, uh, as the way to find a rink in particular. Well, basically, uh, obviously you use the trial lens. And if I'm playing singles, I like four bowls on the trial lens, which you're entitled to have. A lot of people only play two, but in the rules of the game, if you're playing a county competition, national competition, you're allowed four bowls. And I, I use four bowls because I make full use of them. I always start off by bowling at the boundary peg of the rink. One, one on the backhand, one on the forehand, see where the bowl finishes. On the backhand, I might get it right straight away, I might finish on the centre line, whereas I, when I bowl on the forehand, I might be narrow or wide. And I then know which side is turning more than the other. But if I don't get it right with the first two bowls, I then have two more bowls. And after you've had four bowls in each direction, you should have a good idea of the line on the particular length. And I usually, if I'm throwing the jack, put it full length. Because um, if the bowl finishes on a line with the jack in a full length, it should finish somewhere close on a shorter medium. It can be argued that on a full length, the bowl does turn a bit more very often because of the compaction. But um, those are the little things that you've got to allow for and you've got to find out. But after the trial ends, you should have a pretty good idea of the line. Of course, when the mat goes up the green, then you have to move into a different mark. So just to recap, you actually use a, a, a rink marker. So presumably, when you're on the mat, you are imagining first and foremost a straight line yeah. from the middle of the mat out to a point in the first instance, irrespective of the curve that the bowl is taking. Yes. And then your objective, particularly on the trial end, in finding a rink, is to try to achieve the middle of the rink 
more or less irrespective of how successful you are at weight. Am I correct yeah, yes, in that? Yes, yes. And when you've actually done that, and say for example, you're using the boundary peg on the first, first bowl on the forehand, and you're using a straight line, imagining a straight line from the middle of the mat out to the boundary peg, mm. and the bowl doesn't get back to the centre line, you then will calculate how much to bring that line in. That's the difficulty. How, do you do a, a guesstimate, David? Um, I'm a great believer in, on a rink of having as many points of reference as you can. You're going to need points of reference for all lengths of jack because on the end of the green it might be, it might be brown and they might sweep across. So therefore, whereas you were bowling at the boundary peg, we'll say, and finishing somewhere near on, on the medium length, when you go to the longer length, you may have to go outside that because it's going to turn more at the depth. Um, so you're going to have these, you know, re make allowance for these little things. Also on the bowling green there are marks. And you may find that with the mat two yards in the ditch, to get on the right line for short and a medium, you have to go over a certain muck patch on the green. Now when you take the mat up the green, you're then going to play inside that patch. Because if you take the same point of aim, you are increasing the angle, aren't you? So therefore you have to keep the same angle but you will pass inside that patch. And all, the, all these marks are very, very important, particularly on a tricky rink. I think as far as I was concerned, it was you that uh, made me pay attention to the boundary pegs, although being a fairly natural bowler, I didn't really know in the early days exactly what I did. But I certainly became aware on a grass green of the variant colours. There's always a different colour on, on a green. So I tried to utilise that. And how I learnt that was from playing in a Crown Green tournament because their jack is biased and they usually use marks on the grass green in order to throw the jack because wherever the jack is going to go, wherever the jack has been, if you can follow the identical mark, the ball will go. And they actually look at their uh, marks sometimes, well mo mainly, three or four metres in front of them. That's where the jack's gone, that's where the ball's gone. If you've got the right weight, you've got the right ball. But I've always been uncomfortable with you, the way you've um, found the way to, to, to the rink by actually looking at the boundary marks because on a short jack I found it too difficult to look all the way down the green and to, to bring my, my eyes back. Mm. So I've tried to focus on, on getting a mark that's sometimes jack high. Mm. So very similar mm. to what you're mm. doing but mm. instead of going all the way to the boundary I've actually looked at a mark which is level with jack high. And I think that the, the lesson that I've learned is that providing you do something when you are in, in a trial end situation, it does help you to de determine the line because if you're standing there and you're not finding it and you're just hoping eventually that something will happen, like, like a, something from the sky that's magical that will allow you to find the green, you can wait all day. But if you can do something about it during that game, mm. then it helps you. Now, I remember in the Scottish Masters when years ago when we used to have a sponsor who was a building society called Woolwich and they had a sign across the end of the green and I was playing Richard Corsi and on, on the same rink because it was only one television rink after you'd finished. Mm -hmm. You walked into the dressing room before I, before I went out to play and said I found that forehand a treat. I used the C of the Woolwich all the time and the bowls came back to the middle and all I did was just my weight. I didn't use that system in those days. I was fairly natural. And I was beating Richard Corsi, and he gradually wore away at my lead and almost got level with me, and it was about 19 all. And I thought, I'm going to lose this because what I'm doing isn't working. And going in that direction, I remembered you coming into the changing room. I looked for the C, bowled my four bowls at the C, got the two shots I did, and went in and shook hands and, and, won, mm. and went on to win in the mm. final. So being aware of uh, other alternatives mm. Mm. is a great advantage. Mm. Andy, I know that you perhaps don't advocate what David's doing, but tell us what you do. Well, going back to David, I'm totally baffled. Uh, I must say, I'm totally <laughs> baffled. <laughs> I could just never, ever, ever do the way David. However, he's the greatest in the world, so I stand by it. I must be correct. However, the way that I actually, <laughs> the way that the way that I do it is actually I just uh, very much like Ellen says. First of all, when when I stand onto the mat. I actually have the feet in the position that I'm actually going to be bowling. So that to me is number one, get my feet in the position. That is the line that I'm picking. So what I'm really trying to do is pick a line that my feet are aiming towards. I mean, as far as I'm picking a line, I'll look at the jack 
and then pick what I think is an imaginary line. I certainly don't look at a mark on the green, I don't look at a mark on the banking, I just pick from my delivery a mark, that, well not a mark, but a, a an action that I think just is going to find the centre of the, the, the rink. So I really, in all honesty, do not look at anything apart from the jack. So what you're actually doing, presumably, when you're placing the bowl on, 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 the, on the mat, you're in a low position, yes. your eye line is level, yeah. and what you're telling me, I think, is that you are, you've already mentally painted a path all the way to the jack dependent on whether the green is an indoor or a fast outdoor green, so it's a wide path or whether it's a tricky one. And, and, and. So you really have mentally designed the road. You've yes. drawn your old map beforehand. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, obviously, yeah, you're right. I mean, obviously, I've, I've pictured the road should be probably, you know, as David says, one foot outside the marker. And now I would think, right, that's my mark. However, I don't actually look at anything whilst bowling. I'm not actually looking at a point. I know that that, that should be taken and I aim the, the body towards that direction that I'm bowling. So you, so as we <coughs> would see, your body in, and, and, and feet are all in line. Yes, the, with, the, the top of the... my shoulders is level. Everything, everything from a, when I deliver, my shoulders should be level. That is why, as I say, some people who actually bowl straight on the mat, their shoulders, when they're delivering, their shoulder tends to push up. And I think that is sometimes where you, you miss a line, where the upper part of your body has got too much movement. What I'm really doing is when I'm delivering, the upper part of my body is fairly level. So things are fairly level, a bit like a golfer, he tries to keep his head still. I'm fairly level, level shoulders, fairly still head. So everything is down a line but I'm not actually looking at anything from a delivery. So a general advice would be, with delivery, is to make things simple, to place your, your, your body, your feet, your alignment, your shoulders and arm, all in line where, where you've either done the Bryant system looking at the line to the bank, yeah. done the Thompson system where you've drawn the, the actual line on the green, yeah. or something like myself who's found a, a loose leaf until it moves yeah. that's going to get you, get yes. you there. Yes. And you yeah. believe that, but, but actually by creating problems initially, that you, you're going to have to overcome them and that might in, 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 in introduce inconsistency. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. David, have you ever, ever changed your... Uh, eye line to utilise a patch on the green at any any point of time. Oh yeah, well, yes, I mean I, you start off that. What I'm saying, start off that way. Yeah. It's, but it doesn't mean to say you'll be looking at that after you you'll be seeing where your ball's going over. Like for him, on this green here, there are a lot of patches on the green. I mean, if you if you're going over those patches, so as I say, as soon as the mat goes up the green, you know you've got to be bowling inside them. Um, you it, it, you start off with points of reference. I start off using the bank. I wonder how much this green is going to swing, so I aim at the boundary peg. If it sticks wide, I've got to come in. If it cuts across, I've got to take more. But, but then, when I do get it right, I'm looking at the patches on the grass that my bowl is going over. It's all points of reference. The more points of reference you can get, the better. The difficulty I would actually find in that, Tony, is, I mean, for example, the mat at the start of a game, say, is 10 feet. And say the mat varies by 11 feet, by 12 feet, by 15 feet. To me, I think it's difficult to then figure out exactly which point of the banking you're looking at. For me, anyway, to pick a line, I, I, I just, I don't know how David's actually worked on that theory. Uh, you know, it's worked for David, so I can't argue I, with I'm it. I'm not looking at the bank. I thought you did actually oh, say you on were the trial at, ends. Oh, on, on the trial ends. Oh, only on the trial ends. I thought you were actually during no, the game. No, 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 no. That I'm, I'm using patches on the green. I start off on the trial ends to find to find the line. Right. Finish. Then right. I look at my my ball goes over, and I'm using th things on on the green. I thought you actually meant a point on, on the, the bank. Green. It, it's uh, still there. You could still go back to that if you if you if you if you miss it again, you can go right. back to the bank right. because because right. it will change. The mm. green does change, but. Um, You'll, you'll find marks on the green, but of course on a perfect bowling green, it, it's not so easy to find yeah. marks on yeah. the green. No. Yeah. Ian Schubach um, w was, a, was a great one to watch because he particularly um, chose his line from the, from the bank yeah. at all mm -hmm. times. Yes. And you could physically see that when he was delivering, his head would move mm -hmm. from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And I asked him specifically what he was mm -hmm. doing, and he was actually using the, the, the focus on the jack to, to, to actually memorise the length, e.g. Mm. short, mm. medium or long. He then turned his eyes to where he was going to aim mm. and flashed back. Mm. And then I asked him one question. Finally, where, in what position are those eyes? Are they at the jack or at where you're going to aim? And it was 
where he's going to aim. Mm -hmm. Because he did it so quickly, mm -hmm. he could still remember where the jack was. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even on, on a wide swinging green, you can almost focus, while by concentrating, looking at where you're going to deliver, you can still see the jack in your focus. Mm -hmm. And he'd memorized the length, but gone, gone indeed to, to, to the line. And of course, he used that method very, very mm -hmm. successfully. And obviously what Australians are taught to. Mm -hmm. We have our own, our own system. Mm -hmm. Finally though, we've seen from, uh, in, 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 in the television d days of all, we've seen one or two players who have been extremely successful, who have delivered their bowl seemingly looking at the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Any explanation? Mm -hmm. Well, that's obviously referring to Ian Taylor, isn't yes. it? I mean, Ian Taylor had uh, one of the most unique deliveries ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, again, couldn't... Uh, again, it's a bit like me, I suppose, in a way. He's actually bowling blind. I mean, he's actually got his fancy delivery, but he was actually looking at the ground. He had obviously imagined in a line when, you know, it was looking at the ground, then up onto the onto the actual line that he was bowling, very much like myself, I guess. He would be looking at nothing on the green or the bank. He would actually just be looking down at the ground and then picking a road mm. once he came up. Mm. That, that's the way that I perceived his delivery to be. I don't know how mm. you actually I, found it. I'd agree with that. Mm. I'd agree so with so that. what he's actually done, he's done a bit of homework before. He hasn't just stepped on the mat, put his head on the ground and away he's gone. He's actually, at some point of time, looked at the line, looked at the Bryant system, looked at the Thompson system or looked at the patch on the green and in fact, in the final hour, he's delivered but memorised mm. the way to go. Yeah. Be a lot simpler if he looked at it though, wouldn't it? <laughs> but he used to have two or three goes at doing that. His arm would go like this and then he'd stop and he'd have another go. And on one occasion when I was playing against him, I'd take in fact four strides down the green and I looked back, he was still doing it. I thought he delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the peculiarity. Yeah. Of I came the back and didn't even know I walked up in front of him. But it, but it that's quite true that. I, yeah. He had three goes and he usually delivered then, so I thought he's here we go. And I started up and I looked round and suddenly, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> <Sit it before>. <laughs> <laughs>
of looking at the center of the ring to assess the line. Yep. Third try. So having achieved that, now either by design or mistake, you have actually got to say, OK, Amy, the bowl is in the middle of the rink. Yep. Was that by design or was that a mistake? That was by design. I achieved that by bringing my aiming point closer to the centre of the rink, therefore the bowl came back to the centre of the rink. And this is the style that is adopted by David Bryant. It isn't the style that actually is adopted by myself all the time. What I will now be doing is looking at your delivery, your next delivery, and I will be looking at a mark on the green between the mat and the jack to actually find my line. So would you like to deliver again okay. using your uh, way, your method of achieving the, the, the line? doing it not very well. Yes, OK, but I actually have realised now exactly where the patch is on the green that I need to go over and I will attempt that delivery by using another method. But although our bowls are very similar, my line is going to be very similar to yours with the exception that the method I'm trying is different to yours. So, Instead of looking all the way along to the bank, I look at a, a place which is along the line that you took, but I'm using, being a natural green, I'm using something on the green which will enable me to get the correct line. So obviously poised on that delivery, I take my delivery over the patch. So, it's a different method, but the same result. You're using a place, an aiming point on the bank, so you're almost thinking a straight line. Yeah. I'm actually looking at something between the jack and the mat in order to get the shot. Why don't you try it? There's the patch, the little patch there. Have a look at the patch and see how you go. Not bad, Amy. Perhaps you should try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs>
And uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that because they play particularly good line because they actually place their feet down the line and then take a very short step to complete, to complete the step. They take half the step or two thirds of the step before they deliver and then just step the last bit as they go through with their arm. And they do play tremendous line, there's no doubt about that. They probably hit the line more successfully than any other nation. Do you think it's a lesson for us then, David, that we should actually turn our attention to delivery? Because when you look at a, an outdoor green in this country, or indeed an indoor green, we have a, a, a variance of delivery between all, all, all players. Yes, I think we, we encourage players to develop the natural style. And I do a lot of coaching, and I, we, we do that where possible. But somebody who is spraying them around and can't hit a line, very quickly say, try this, and put, the, put them in the South African clinic style or the semi-fixed, and immediately they're, they're bowling um, a fair line. They may not get the length, but at least they're getting the line, and you can't do anything to adjust your weight unless you're hitting good line. You, you know, if you, you can bet your life, if you bowl good weight with two bowls, that's the two you miss your line with, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's sod's law, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Tell me, you had a, a very unique style, a very, very unique delivery. Tell me how you designed this and what the advantages of it were to you. I mean, a lot of people have copied it, but never been successful. It was phenomenal for you as, with respect to your wins. Well, it all started really uh, with my own club at Clevedon, and, and the green there um, would go up as much as 15 or 16 seconds. Um, it, it was, it was a, um, a fescue green originally, and then usually had bents were introduced. It was very, very fast and used to go brown all over. In fact, um, Back in those days, and I'm going back to the 40s, um, the 50s, the greens then were, were used to go brown. You don't see a brown green very often these days, but they used to go brown. And you'd be going out into the next rink. And when the green got fast, I heard one or two members say, well, of course, it's all about leg control. You've got to have leg, good leg control on these fast conditions. My thoughts were, well, if you can cut the legs out, it's just the arm action. So I thought, how can I cut the legs out? So I thought, well, if, if I go up, if I come down, I've got to come down very controlled. But if I start near the ground, then all I've got to do is just to step forward and bowl. And that was how it developed. And the theory must have been right, because I, I play my, I always have played my best bowls on fast conditions. I'd be more successful in the southern hemisphere than I have in the north. Can you demonstrate this delivery to, to us now? <laughs> I, I can't deliver it, uh, demonstrate it, I'm afraid, Tony, because I can't, I can't get down there. <laughs> Ellen, you've got a, a delivery which is, is, is fairly textbook. How did you design your own delivery? Um, it very much came about naturally, I suppose. Um, obviously, the first part of it is when you actually pick the bowl up and establish your grip, which we talked about um, earlier. And then it's a case of where you stand on the mat. So I was told to position my feet to the line that I was going to take according to the green and then I just naturally went down low. Um, now don't ask me why I did that, that was just the stance that I adopted. I, I went down low and then I developed like almost like a practice swing and then came back again and then delivered um, for the first time and I've actually got a quite quite a big um, back swing and quite um, not an exaggerated but a full follow through. Do you actually concentrate on changing that delivery for for various circumstances or you just change it in accordance with how much weight you want to decrease or, or put on. Do you do anything differently with regards to your delivery with a changing condition like on an outdoor green? Um, I think you do subconsciously to be honest. There's not anything consciously I do. If I was to analyse my delivery indoors and outdoors it would be slightly different in terms of the length of the step and different things like that but it's not something I would consciously do. It, it, it more happens as a course of a natural action. David, they say that if you want to try to, to take weight off or, or when you're transferring from probably a heavy green to a fast green, they say there's one thing that you can do is, is to think slower that, so that that might actually affect the delivery. Do you, do you believe in that? I don't believe in holding a ball back. Um, I, I had this problem when I, when I first played on the very fast greens in New Zealand. I mean, they were fast, they were running over 20 seconds. I actually said, I'm not going to let this bowl out of my sight. And that was how I did it. I, I got down, I can't, I can't get right down on the, but I, I got in a position similar to this. I'm right down on my haunch, just about as low as I can go. Um, now, but I was, I was sitting on my haunch and I was coming up with a bowl and I was doing this. 
and I didn't, didn't let it go back. But I had to have a rhythm. So, so my, my, as I say, my rhythm, my rhythm was just to look down the line, come up and just lift the bowl like that and then go. Okay, David, we noticed just in that sort of mock-up delivery um, something which is very significant with regards to delivery, and that's the back foot. Yeah. We'll probably see bowlers like Amy and indeed Ellen who actually deliver and, and bring their back foot up. Your back foot is always anchored onto the mat in fast conditions, although I've seen a number of times when you've been playing in heavy outdoor conditions when your foot has been elevated off the mat. Do you consciously change this? Um, if it, let me put it this way. If I was bowling really well under fast conditions, I would probably be able to do it in that slow motion and come up and to do that and lift the back foot. But, but initially, until you get that right, until you get the right, you're going to get the touch. Until you've slowed it down and it becomes natural. You see, it's got to become natural. Uh, um, it needs practicing. But, um, you're tr you have to slow it down, yet you have to follow through. The follow through has got to be the same as if you were playing with the long back swing. You've got to go through with it. But instead of taking it back, if I lift the bowl and keep it in front of me and, and just do that as I'm moving and then do that, then go into it. I'm only sort of really playing the, the forward part. Alan, when you deliver, it seems that the, the wrist is, is, is elevated to, to, to the sky and the palm is very straight. Do you actually try to keep, have you been taught to sort of keep from there to there perfectly still so, so that the delivery is like a pendulum? Have you consciously been taught that or is it something that you've designed yourself? Something that I've, I've developed. I mean, with my left hand, I actually um, hold the right hand, which I'm right-handed when I bowl, I actually hold it in place. So Why I'll do you do that? Bowl. I don't know. It's how I've developed it, but again, it, it then controls your actual movement because obviously if you've just got your one arm there, you've got more room for manoeuvre than if you've got this hand to steady it. So, so it actually means that then, in theory, if you were analysing it, then yes, it would mean that it should come back straight and there's therefore less room for manoeuvre by having that anchorage point to go in for. But actually hold it out further, when, when I'm lower down, actually hold it further out so this is, this is aiming towards my aiming point and then come back as a pendulum and deliver. I've noticed that your eye line in your delivery is, is fairly low. Yes. Do you ever move the eyes during the delivery at any point of time, or do you keep them static? Yep. Um, as a matter of course, when I've, I've got the, the bowl here, I'm checking that I've got the right bias. OK. It's <laughs> a good thing <laughs> to do. In all seriousness, I'm checking that I've got the right bias, and then I'm looking up to my aiming point. I'm then looking at where the jack is, then coming back to my aiming point, and then delivering. So the last point that I look at when I deliver is, is the aiming point. And do you consciously use a finger, an index finger, to point at your line in delivery? Are you mentally, some people think, think that, you know, mentally you use that finger to keep the hand absolutely flat in order to place the bowl along the line. Do you mentally think about a finger? No. Um, the, the first time I'd heard of the, of the finger analogy was when you actually mentioned it um, through training for the Commonwealth Games. Before it was basically the hand following the path, but it, naturally it would be the middle finger as that's in the centre of the bowl as it goes through to pick the line. It would be, but when I first started delivery that was never how it was originated, but if you looked at it now, I'd like to think that most times that it would be the index finger that would follow the line of the bowl. And you've ever, have you ever tried, for example, the delivery that Andy Thompson has, has um, derived, where in fact he actually places the bowl on the green uh, in order to get low? You're very, you're pretty low, yeah. but not. Have you ever gone as low as that when when Andy actually places the bowl on the no, green? No, I haven't. I, I mean, I've looked at Andy's delivery and with that type of delivery I think it must be very difficult to miss your line because you're literally on that starting point and, and letting it go but in terms of experimenting it's having the confidence to do that and as David said before if, you, if you're pretty comfortable with your delivery um, you know it's a case of how much do you tinker with it to get it perfect or how much do you just sort of try and build on what you've got already I think that's the question that people have to ask themselves. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. But yes, we all recognise that we can all improve and make slight changes to our own delivery to, to maximise it for our potential, really. David, the, the delivery that you formerly used is a, is a fascinating one. And, um, and, and you volunteered to, to, to show 
um, Ellen exactly um, yes. what like happens. They can cap in a pipe, they tell you. They <laughs> can cap in a pipe. We'll look forward to that. But just one final thing from you, David. Um, you had a, a, a twist. Yeah. A twist. You, we will notice this twist that you that you ut utilised mm. uh, in the body, so that in fact, when the ball was passing through on the backswing, it looked as though your hand was twisting. Yeah. You were the person who introduced it into this country, mm. if not into the world. Can you explain to me in detail before you show Ellen how to do it, um, the reasoning behind that? Right. <coughs> if if you if you put your both palms out like that, and you're bringing them back in a straight line, you get to there. There's only one way they can go, and that's out there. Because it can't, you, can't, you can't come in because of the, the arm's constructed that way. So if you follow that and swing in a straight line, they swing like that. And the arm is relaxed. Immediately you do that, it, there's tension, and the elbows, the elbows move in. So, as I say, if, if, if you if you going moving your feet like that, you're going to fire a rifle. Uh, your hand's coming through there. In order for your hand to go in a straight line, your arm to go in a straight line, it has to, the wrist has to turn. And then it can swing along that line and it comes up and it hits you in the right eye. Well, Ellen, there we are. There you go. We'll now go and try it. <laughs> so, it's time for a bit of fun and to experiment with the famous David Bryant delivery. David, nowadays you have difficulty in maintaining the delivery, but we've got a young, supple superstar <laughs> who's going to experiment. Talk us through this famous Bryant delivery that won so many world titles and Commonwealth Games gold medals. Tell us all about it using the stooge here. Well, first of all, um, we get onto the mat and we place our feet pointing down the line. And when, when we're feeling comfortable, then we sit on our our haunches or squat on our haunches, we go right down and we rest on our haunches and looking down the line we assess the line and when we're ready we come up weighing the bowl in our hand and coming up to the, the appropriate height according to what the pace of the green and the length jack we're playing and then oh, we, away we go. So this, this here, David, I've actually got my arm that's, leaning on yeah, my leg. Fine, Is that how fine. you used to have it? Yeah, and as you, as, you, as you come up, you slide it off the knee and you come so up way in the bowl and then you go did forward. Did you use your left hand at all with your, to steady yes, the bowl? Yes, actual fact, I, now you mentioned I did. I used to hold it exactly so as I'm you do. So I'm cupping the bowl. Yeah, exactly yeah? there, like and that. And then I'm bringing this, so then my right arm yeah. slides off. And you, you're bringing it up, weigh the up. bowl, yeah. And then deliver. How does it feel, Helen? It, it is quite similar to mine, but it's very strange. It's, it's this part that's strange, where you're actually then coming up to deliver. That's, that's the bit where it feels strange, because I'm very much from a, a stand deliver and I'm not moving my body, it's my arm that's doing the work. Whereas David's, this movement up here is what actually gives you the momentum. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the that's the difficult bit to control. How for me did at you, the David? How did you know how far to come up on the delivery? Then did you control the height for a short jack, three quarter, and a long jack? Yes, but more so. Heavy heavy green would be like this. As I say, I'm down here. I'm really nearly down actually. <laughs> well, um, that's, and there, that's something, isn't it? and there, and I'm coming up, and this is a heavy green, so I'm coming right up, and then I'm going through. So do I need to come up further then? Well, not yet. A, a medium. This is a medium pace, isn't it? Yeah. So I would come on this one. I would come. I'd come from there. I'd be looking down the green, lining it up, and I'd be coming up and through. So, Ellen, try again. The only thing you weren't doing is you weren't weighing the bowl. Well, now, yeah. David used to like to weigh the oh, bowl. Oh, weigh the bowl. And yeah. And, what's, and what do you do that for then, David? Well, I'd be on. The, I'd be sitting on my haunches. I'm not coming up. I'm sitting on my haunches. And imagine I'm right down, and I'm looking at the green. I go, I've got to weigh you this. And I'm. I'm Going through my mind, that's my point of aim. Now I've got to get this on the jack, and I'm weighing the ball, and I'm thinking weight. Right, I firmly fixed on the point of aim, I'm thinking weight, and up I come, and So through. You're, still, you're still weighing the bowl as you come up? But yes, it, but it's, yeah, it's, keeping it moving. But it also seems as though you're considering in actually viewing the bowl, you are also considering what you're doing. I'm drawing the shot, I've got to get the line, and yeah. almost the action of weighing up the bowl is also the, 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 the conversation that you're having with yourself to actually determine the action and also to help with concentration. Yes, yes, right. yes. Try yes. It again then. I'll try again. Extra so concentration. Feet, feet together. Yeah. Bend down on the haunches. That's it now. 
Now, in your own here. time, you're thinking, weighing the ball in your hand, you're thinking about weight. At this point, I'm looking at my aiming point. Am yeah, I? and you're thinking, thinking weight. about the shot, thinking, thinking about, about the, the line, shot. determination. Every time yeah. that you move that ball, you're giving a thought process. Okay. Absolutely. And then I'm going to slide my right hand off, but still yeah, keeping the ball moving. Up quite um, naturally. Put it on the jack. Not bad. There we go. A future Miss Bryant. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> for the husband. <laughs>
bowl comfortable in the hand, I bend down. As I bend, I'm having a practice swing. Left hand there to steady the bowl, knees locked. As I come back, it's going to be a big back swing and speed to get the power. And again, following the line of the bowl to learn from the delivery that I've just made. Okay, the way that I start is I pick the bowl up, make sure there's any loose grass on the bowl, make sure that everything is smooth. I step onto the mat, my feet both together, pointing in the direction that I'm going to be bowling. I then push the ball out so that I've got the correct bias, having the left hand resting on the ball to make sure that the ball is properly addressed in my hand. I then kneel down, putting the ball onto my toe, the top of my toe. I've always done it like that. So that it actually feels very comfortable for me. Step forward, release the ball. The drive shot, pick the ball up, make sure all the grass is off the ball. Feet are at very straight towards the, the on the drive shot. Again, the, the ball's resting with my left hand. Again, I'm actually just looking down at the jack. Again, I actually kneel down as I do with the draw. Big back swing, push the ball through. Normally I hit it all the time. I'm now going to show you my delivery technique for the draw. I place my right foot on the mat, pointing down my delivery line, my line of aim. I step in front of it, going down the line of aim. I then adjust my back foot to make me nice and comfortable. I'm now well balanced. I take aim, I'm sliding over the bowl, down that delivery line. And when I'm ready, with I firmly fixed up on the delivery line, away I go. and I watched the bowl all the way down the green.
The second shot I would like to demonstrate is the running shot. That is the shot played with a yard of running, two yards, five yards, ten yards, but not the flat out drive. Now in this instance, I'm going to try and play inside the bowl and trail the jack perhaps two or three yards. So therefore, I have to adopt a higher stance with a bigger backswing to impart more weight. I'm not driving, I'm coming down on a reduced line, but with extra weight. So the, the drill is the same, you place the right foot down the line, which is now obviously not as wide as the drawing line. You step forward, not as, not as far forward as before, probably, because I'm going to have a higher stance. So I'm standing much higher, I'm taking aim, I'm allowing this ball perhaps, you know, 18 inches, two feet of green. And when I'm balanced with my eye firmly fixed on my point of aim, I come back and I go through. And again, I watch the ball right the way down the green because you have to concentrate all the time. That's the essence of the game is concentration. And now the drive shot, which we start in the same way. I place my right foot on the mat, pointing at the jack, because that's what I'm aiming at. I place my left foot, pointing at the jack, turn the heel, get myself nicely balanced. I line up, I stand as high as I can. I come onto the toe, my right foot, because I'm going to step off very quickly on it with a long back swing, and I go straight through at the jack. Well, I'm ready. And here I go. Well, ladies, the weighted shot, difficult call out? Uh, yeah, very, especially knowing what the weighted shot is. I think we should clarify exactly what the weighted shot is um, because so many people get a yard on, which is that, mixed up with four yards on, mixed up with even more. So how would you define a weighted shot? Yeah, I think that's important. I think the yard on um, term is used loosely. And it yeah. can mean exactly what you say, um, any amount of weight st stretching from a yard on uh, to four, five, six or seven. Yeah. How do you, Ellen, interpret a yard on shot? If it's somebody says to you, play a yard on shot, what mentally do you think about? Just over the draw, basically. So you're just playing literally over the draw. So you're looking for the bowl to stop a yard past where, where the actual target point is. So if you were thinking about the yard on being a yard on, yeah. you would then think that it's a draw shot but a yard beyond the jack? Yeah. Are you agreed on that? Yes, definitely. Okay. So that now, having established what the pure yard on shot is, um, we now look to the weighted shot, which is a very difficult one. 
I've always felt that the, the, way to, the way to approach the weighted shot is to try to be consistent in the weight that you try to play. It's so difficult because every surface has different um, peculiarities. Some will, bowls won't bend as much as you think, other times they will bend a lot more than you think. But if you approach the shot playing almost the same feel, I use the word feel as opposed to weight, because weight is about feel, yeah. then I think that you become to terms with playing a certain shot with a certain feel. And, and in fact it becomes more and more grooved. Now, when you're actually on the mat, Amy, and you're, you're skipping for England, and somebody's asked you to come into a head because you're three down and you've got to play a weighty shot but you can't play an out and out drive shot which is with minimum bias how do you mentally approach that shot do you do, you do it visually do you do it mentally any any secrets that you can share with us um i think first of all you've got to mentally say to yourself i'm going to do this this is going to be successful that's the line that i'm going to take um and use mental imagery so you, you know exactly what's going to happen and I think the second thing is looking for looking for a line that's under the line of the draw obviously um, but you know you're fishing for a line that you think the weight that you use is going to be successful and if that means using a bowl um, that you need to just get round or just get under then I think that's a good point of reference. When you, you're playing weight Ellen do you actually think three yards, four yards, five yards, having established it's not a yard on shot, you've just said what that is, it's just over the draw, do you actually think in those terms four, five, six yards or do you think ditch weight or in general terms when you play? I think often it depends on the position of the bowls in the head. Um, you'll often pick a key bowl that, you, that you'll work with that will become your aiming point. I think you then adjust your weight according to where that bowl sits. So for example, if it's that much away from the jack, you know that it's got to be more weight than if it's that much away from the jack. So therefore you bring your weight into line with the line that you're going to take. And like Amy, I very much use visual imagery, so I can actually pick the, the line that I'm going to do. And if I'm within inside of that bowl, I'm going to be on target. Talking to David um, Bryant and, and, and Andy, they have different ways of which they achieve the line drawing to the jack. Um, but are you universally agreed to, or together about the fact that when you're playing a weighted shot you tend to use the head lie or what exactly is lying there so you turn your attention to to the bowls or the head lie or do you still remember where you've you've taken your line from the bank or the green with regards to drawing i think it's a mixture because you need to know where your line your draw line is um, and then you need to use the position of the head and I think sometimes you can't use the position of the head for whatever reason, you, maybe the bowls aren't laying in, in such a way um, especially if the head is you know, a bowl behind a bowl, you know, just a single bowl target so that's where you use the line, I think if the head is built up and there's bowls in front you can use the position of those bowls to, to assist I mean that was one of your speciality shots uh, Tony so what did you do? Well I actually always but always used the head lie I looked at bowls in the head and thought which bowl is inviting me to aim at it in order for me to get to where I want to hit so I calculated if a bowl was sitting sort of to the right of the target by about six inches. I knew in my own mind that by aiming at that key bowl, by the time the bowl had actually left my hand and reached that key bowl, hopefully it will have bent six inches, which would put me onto the target. Yeah. Didn't always work, but that's how I approached it. I used what I call the key bowl system. So I was mindful of where the, la the drawing line was, and we all know that to bring uh, to play a weighted shot we need to bring the bowl in now a lot of people just do that just bring the bowl in and play weight willy-nilly yeah. and sometimes it will come off and sometimes it won't but if you're going to be successful you've got to be a little bit more calculated than that and look for bowls look there's usually a bowl that's going to be near to or in the way which has made you play weight so why don't you use it as a positive attribute instead of a negative one and think well if I can aim just inside of that by the time the bowl has left my hand hopefully it will bend inside yeah. and we'll get and we'll get the, um, the the actual target one of the things that people do make a mistake with when they're trying to play weight particularly on a fast screen or indoors they tend to play too much weight yeah. because we have a lot of weight within us and one touch on the bowl and the bowl is gone and that will be a problem for people on fast screens they 
overcompensate. But you are modern ladies uh, uh, of, of an ancient sport, and I do know that it isn't. It has been frowned upon, as it was in my day, um, using the weighted shot and, and the firing shot. Do you find any pressure am, uh, amongst your peers about playing that shot if you were to play it um, at a club match and you played it twice and miss? Do you find that the pressure from your peer group that you should have drawn um, affects that your thinking and your philosophy for your approaching your next match? Um, I think, yes, I can understand where you're coming from, um, but it's like any shot, if it's unsuccessful, people will, well, some people, especially in um, local teams and things, think, well, oh, you shouldn't have played that shot anyway, you know, that was the wrong shot to play. If it was successful, it was like, oh, wow, and it gives you confidence as well to go, if it's the next end, to play the same shot. Um, but I definitely think there's pressure, especially being a, a young female, they don't expect you, you know, you, they expect you to draw most of the time. Helen, have you ever gone out specifically on a bowling green to practice the weighted shot? Yeah, I have, yeah. And have you actually used, what have you just used, a jack or have you used dusters or any markers or...? Generally I take another set of bowls with me. To, I mean, hitting a bare jack is obviously, you know, a very small target and therefore more difficult. And whilst you need to practice that, you also need to build your confidence up as well. So in a practice situation you probably start with a big target and then make it smaller so as your confidence increases you've got more chance of being successful. There are times when we've simply got to play the weighted shot. Why do you feel in this single situation that the weighted shot will be the choice shot? I think it's important to play the weighted shot here, Tony, simply because the backhand, both the balls, are, certainly the, my own ball, has actually blocked out the backhand draw. It's possible to slip that ball and maybe draw to the back ball. That, however, is such a difficult shot that I think on the backhand draw it's very difficult. My opponent's centre ball here is stopping the drive. So that really, that really stops two shots, which really leaves only one shot on here, which is reaching through the head with four or five yards away, which is a running ball. And that's the shot I'm going to try to attempt here. David, why in this single situation wouldn't you draw the shot here? Well, uh, obviously, Green has the two backwards and has an opportunity to score three if the jack goes through cleanly. Um, if, for instance, the game was 19 all. Green would then win the game, or if, if the jack went through, but if he dislodged one of the bowls, he would reduce it to one. And really, the, off the forehand is the percentage shot, because you can come in to take that bowl, you could take the jack, you might even nick that bowl going away, so your actual target is, from the, is about that wide. When you assess all your shots, are you basing it each time on the percentage of success that you're likely to achieve? Mostly, yes. Mostly. And in this case, I mean, drawing on the backhand, um, you might get the shot, but you certainly, unless you get very close to the jack, you're not going to reduce it. We're off the forehand. You could save three ways. You could come under the blackwood, under the jack, or on the other blackwood. Do you think people make a mistake in this situation, highly pressurised situation, obviously match a, um, um, game against? People make a mistake by imagining that the green's going to do wonderful things when in reality it isn't. I think it is, Tony. I mean, I think sometimes when the pressure situation is against you, I think it's sometimes easier to play an attacking ball. The drawing ball is the perfect ball here, and, and you know, it, it would be a wonderful ball to draw it. However, I think when people are under pressure, the easier shot tends to be the running ball. Tends to be at least you're going to run through the head and try, as David says, try to reduce it. Take one ball out, take the jack out. So I think you've got to go for the percentages, and I think the percentages here are to attack the head. Take one ball out, take the jack through for the game. The draw shot really is too much of a pressure shot here. So it's an attacking shot on the forehand, um, played with some weight. Do you actually, in this situation, say specifically the amount of weight you're going to play, or do you judge it by feel? In this situation, the main thing is to be positive. So therefore, you play with the weight that you're most suited with. In other words, if you feel, if I'm going to allow it to bend a bit, I might miss it, then go that bit straighter and make sure of it. That, you must be absolutely positive in what you're trying to do when you go on the mat. 
Uh, the last thing to do is to start having, do I play it with five yards, do I play it with ten yards? You've got to make your mind up going back and say, right, when you get back, this is how I'm going to play it and step on the mat and be absolutely ter determined. Well, I'll tell you what, you two do that, go back to the mat, discuss it, tell us how to play it, and when you get on the mat, tell us what you're looking for. Off you go. Okay. <laughs> What I'm going to do here, David, is that the wing ball here is my target ball. That is what I'm aiming for. I'm going to aim for that ball with four or five yards away. It should come inside the ball, hopefully pick up the jack or take one of the balls out. So the wing ball is the target ball here. Right. Go to it, Andy. That's it. That's it. <laughs> 2019. <laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, David, that's how easy it was. You showed me how you could do it. Andy, the drive shot is one which people avoid because often they don't know how to cope with it. What's the secrets of the drive shot? Yes, I think it is a difficult shot, Tony. I think it's fair to say that the people in the northern hemisphere find it a harder shot than they do in the southern hemisphere where the greens are fast. Our greens in the northern hemisphere are a bit heavy and it's a shot that we are not familiar with as much. You know, we play the, the draw shot, the yard on shot, and that is a shot that we are very good at. However, the drive shot is something that is vital. It's absolutely vital as part of our game. And I think it's an area, especially more so for the faster indoor greens, where you've got to be very good at. And I think technically, from my own aspect, that, that's the one area where I've actually struggled a little bit on it. Uh, I would say that uh, I, most people tend to have a preference for one hand or the other as far as driving is concerned. And I've slightly preferred the forehand for driving. And one of the problems that I've had uh, managed to unfortunately uh, get over it over the last few years or one of the problems that I've faced is actually the hooking in the forehand. So that's bringing the, the hand slightly bringing across. Bringing the hand over and I think it's probably because I've maybe been trying to deliver the ball too fast, possibly been stepping forward, too much weight and the more weight you actually put onto the delivery the more you tend to actually hook the delivery action. And I could actually remember a few years ago we went over to Zimbabwe, the pair of us, and you were actually looked in, at my delivery style and said, well, I should do this and should do that. And as I say, it's one of the areas that I've experimented probably more with any other thing in trying to get that shot perfected. Uh, tell me, Andy, when you're facing a drive shot, what, difference, what dif do you do differently to the draw shot? Again, I don't do anything differently. As far, as far as I look at the jack, and again, what I'm aiming at would probably be two or three inches to one side of the jack. That would be the target, allowing the bias to have very little effect, trying to go as fast as I can. And I think that's the one area in the drive shot that we should actually try to, to look carefully at, is what speed we're actually driving. Some people, I think, drive too fast. When you drive too fast, you lose control of the, of the delivery. And I think that is why when I say that hook on the forehand, it's probably because I'm driving too fast. Too much weight, losing control of the body action. And I think that, that's why I've lost it. David, we've heard that Andy has a preference, slight preference for the forehand. Was that your favourite hand too? No, mine was the backhand. Um, 
Pure and simply, I, I found it natural to me. Uh, I, I prefer the backhand for all shots, really. Um, I have no problem with the forehand with playing a running shot at all, but if I did make a mistake on the forehand, I hooked. Um, I've since found a way of curing that, and that is the placing of, of the feet off the forehand. Um, whereas if you stand, stand like that if you're playing the backhand, if you bring that foot round slightly, it's very difficult to, to, to hook. It, I mean, if you bring around too much, you're going to miss the other side, but, but it does stop you pivoting. You're, 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 you step there, whereas there is a tendency, if, you, if you're not stood like that, of stepping and doing, doing that, the elbow coming out. I need our lesson shortly, David. <laughs> <laughs> so but we, but basically, we do this you know, with, with new boaters, particularly. We do yeah. it with the draw. If we get somebody hooking, particularly the ladies, if they're hooking, um, bring that foot round, and it's very difficult for them to, to hook now because they got that foot forward. When you were driving, David, um, did you do anything differently to your delivery, or did you deliver like Andy? Andy used the same shot for his draw as he did for his drive. Did you use the same shot? The no, same, I, no uh, I, uh, we're going back a few years when I was in the full crouch. I can't get in the full crouch now, as I explained, but um, with the drive, I was always stood up here. I, I always stood up, t taking aim and this foot up on toe on this foot, and then straight back and straight through. I used to inc I used to increase the speed as I went through. On the drawback, it was steady. So I'm taking aim, I'm drawing back, I'm putting weight forward, but to weight forward, I'm coming back slowly, and then I'm through on all the weight forward over the so foot. So basically, it's interesting that you're putting the momentum on the bowl in front of you as opposed from behind. Yes, I don't now, jerk back. No, I, I now a lot them. of people try to get the momentum from behind yes. instead of the forward. Two other aspects of your firing delivery, you stood up because presumably it was far more athletic and you got the yes. speed. You lifted, you said, your foot. Yes. Why was that? Well, I, well, I, I, think, I've always, I think I've always been on the ball of the foot, but I, I've now changed my delivery to, to the semi-fixed where I, I am, I have got this foot slightly forward. I probably moved it more forward now than I would have before. Probably it was there before, just slightly forward. Now it's more forward. But if I'm driving, I'm up there, I'm standing high, but I'm on the foot because as my, as my arm comes back and I'm going, I have to come up and then So you're ready through. to go. Yeah. And the other thing that, that was unique to your drive style was the very nature that your right shoulder was slightly up. Uh, as opposed to to the left one, why was that? Well, I, um, I, I I hadn't got an obvious answer for that one, but I, I think it was because I was holding the bowl higher to get the swing. So I, rather than hold it there and take it back there, if I hold it up there and I'm looking over the top, I'm sighting over the top of it. I'm now thinking right, I'm ready, and I I I, I come back and then through, but I don't jerk back come back steadily. Why, unlike Andy then, why did you have a, a different delivery for the drive as opposed to the draw? Well, basically, I was told as a, as a youngster, don't do too much driving, my son, you lose your length. You lose your length. So I thought, well, the easiest way around this is to have two separate deliveries. So I, all, all my running shots are played um, Either a yard of running, two yards of running, three yards of running, perhaps four, five from, from the crouch. But when I'm playing heavier, like a firm bowl, but allowing it to swing with, say, 18 inches, I'll play that from the fully, fully upright. But uh, the reason for having two different deliveries is that with the upright stance, I could get more pace. And also, it wouldn't affect me drawing. I could, I could drive three and then draw with, with the four. That's, a, that's talking about the delivery action. I mean, I could remember, if, as we've talked earlier, about Ian Schubert. Now, Ian Schubert, as we've talked earlier, he, when he used to draw, he had his thumb quite high up. However, when he used to drive, he used to change his delivery action with a thumb here on the side. As I said earlier on, you actually get more power. And that's the reason that he actually changed. He put the thumb on the side because he knew he can get more power in the delivery as opposed to the thumb on the top. Again, that's another area that I maybe should experiment with. Yeah, I think you should, Dandy, and they'll probably take you for a, for a lesson. Um, Andy, when, you, when you're actually facing a match, um, 
Do you actually utilise a drive shot on a trial end at all? No, I never do. Never do. I know. I know some players do. I. Uh, the most important thing for me in the bread and butter shot is the draw shot. I'm more important for as far as I'm concerned is trying to, to find the line, as it were, and find at the pace of the green. I think the drive is something that we've practised prior to the game, and I think it's something that I don't think we need personally necessarily to find the drive. There are people who do it, and that's fair enough. I don't ever do it. I don't know. Do you do it, David? I've never seen you doing it. No, no. I I, I might go out. If I'm not driving well, I go out and have a practice. Oh, yes, that's good. But, you know, but not I, in a trial end. I'll, I'll bang away at the jacks up and down for four or five ends just to, to get me, make sure yeah. I got my delivery right, and then I feel confident it's right. Yeah. And do you ever then, after you've practiced the drive shot, do you actually go back, do you finish on, on, the, on the drive shot, or do you go into a draw shot mode before you go home? I might finish on the draw shot, yes, yes, just to see that if, if it's affected my, my weight at all. You were a great driver. What, what was your what was your secret of the heavy I, ball? I, I didn't like I didn't like driving. But you played it well, didn't but you? But I played it well, always purely on the backhand, yeah. because I believe that on the backhand drive the the elbow is next to the hip bone, mm. and there's very little play involved. And latterly, I incorrectly played my feet almost straight onto the target, when. Uh, textbooks would tell you perhaps that you should move slightly if you're far driving on the on on the backhand it's coming in that direction you should move your feet slightly out the way yeah, yeah. but i didn't and so and therefore i almost fired slightly at that angle instead of straight mm -hmm. on but it was something that i practiced i didn't like the drive shot it was not a shot that was a favorite of mine i was a successful driver i only drove when i had to I did practice it and was far more successful on the backhand and the forehand. And in fact, bearing that in mind, when we did the training for the 2002 Commonwealth Games, I actually took people through the exercise of the drive shot and it was surprising that people learnt for the first time which was their preferred hand in the drive. They'd never thought about it before. Yeah. But it yeah. is clear yeah. that we are better on one hand with the drive shot yeah. than the other. And we're very lucky if we, we can get the same percentage on both hands. So that's important. But I, I certainly always tried to focus on, on the jack when I was practicing because you, if you can hit or get near to a bear jack when you're practicing, invariably when you come to, pra to drive in real life, you've got something bigger to hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the tip is, drive always in practice at a bear jack because you'll be surprising how big the bowls look when you come to drive in reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then Andy, we've had a look at the head down there, we've both decided that the drive shot is the right shot as the target's quite a reasonable size target. So I think as you're world number one, you should go first. You should show me how to do it. Yeah, I think so as well, Ellen. Uh, okay. Here I go then. I'll let you oh. watch me driving. Okay. So what were you thinking about when you were playing that drive shot? What I think what at? I really did is, I mean, it's quite common, I think what a lot of people actually do on the drive is, very much like myself, I tend to hook the, the drive. And I think sometimes, Tony Alcock's taught me quite a lot of this, that what I'm doing is I'm not really following my body through the, the delivery action. I think what I probably did was snatch it. And I think when you snatch it, you come across your body and you hook it. So what you're saying is you need to get all the energy through the body in the line of where you're actually delivering for the drive shot. That's right, that's right. I deliberately actually hooked the first one so as you could then correct that point. <laughs> what I'll now do is show you how it should be really done. OK, I look forward to that, Andy. You've hit the target. Do you think I can have a go now? Well, you're the world indoor singles champion. <laughs> I'd be very disappointed if you missed that. OK. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Very good, very good. 
So do you think I got my body through that enough? I think it was perfect. I think it was a perfect drive. I think the difference between our two drives was I think you played more of a timing shot. Yeah. I played a faster ball. And I think you probably played a better way. I think the most important shot in the drive, when you're driving, you drive with the pace that you think is the most comfortable. Yeah. Sometimes I feel that I drive too fast. And I think that is something that people should learn. Slow the drive down. I think it's better. I think your pace is better. It's interesting because indoors, I would say that I drive a lot quicker because mm. obviously the surface is faster than what I do outdoors. Therefore, outdoors, I have to allow a bit more for the bend into the head because I can't get as much pace behind it as I can indoors. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, especially in the, the slower UK greens. I think that's a good pace to play with. Okay. Show me the last one wasn't a fluke. Okay, then. <laughs> That's why you're the world ender single champion. <laughs>
a sport packed with tradition. A genteel activity that appeals to the older generation. You're absolutely right, it's all of the above, which is what makes bowls so special. But there's more to bowls than that. It's time to think again. Bowls is about excitement, passion, spirit, teamwork and enjoyment. It's a game of power, accuracy, skill and tactics. It's a sport open to everyone. To play at any level, from club sessions to world championships and commonwealth games. Be competitive. Be active. Be challenged. Be healthy. Be your own person. Be part of a team. Be part of a great sport. Be whatever you want to be and become part of history. Play balls. The English Bowling Association has a massive network of clubs across the country, ready and waiting to help you start bowling, whatever your age or skill level. It's up to you what you want to do. You can just play for fun or be part of the club teams, all of whom play in leagues and tournaments. In time, you could progress to the national championships, but just like a skip in a bowls team, when it comes to your bowling, you call the shots. Bowls is a well-organized sport, run by a band of experienced volunteers, all there to help, guide and support you. Wherever you live, there will be a club nearby, ready to give you advice about how to start bowling. The sport can be played all year round, at outdoor clubs in the summer and indoor clubs in the winter. If you want to compete at the highest level, there's a well-developed county system which can lead players into the international setup and a chance to travel the globe and compete for England in a World Championships or a Commonwealth Games. It's all there waiting for you. All you have to do is think again. Whatever you want from sport, bowls has it. Maybe bowls is the sport you want. Give it a try at your local club. To find out how you can become involved with bowls, get in touch with the English Bowling Association, either by telephone on 01903 820 222 or via the internet at www bowlsengland.com Good luck and good bowling. <laughs>